Um, I trust you had a good look at all the photos there. Uh, my assistant, Cassie Pidd, uh, put those together. She asked me, she goes, Bill, could you look at all your photos? Thought, oh, another job. So I start at 11 o'clock one night, three o'clock in the morning, I'm still going through them. And Cathy comes in and says, what are you doing? And uh, I said, leave me alone. This is a special moment. Go back to bed. <laughs> but as I went through the photos, so I, I was crying when I looked at um, uh, the wonderful human beings that God called to be part of our church who are no longer with us, who are in heaven. And, uh, and I think of their amazing contribution. Um, we wouldn't have this physical facility, this property, we wouldn't have this congregation if it wasn't for their prayers, their sacrifice, their giving, their commitments. Uh, I think of um, our very first missionary, Jackie Van Dolken. You see photos there, and I remember when Jackie came and said she had a dream. She had a dream of, of an orphanage in Brazil, of helping children, because she read something about the plight of the, the kids on the streets in Brazil. And she was a, a woman in her probably early 50s then, and she had a lot of medical problems. And I knew Jackie from uh, uh, Bible college days and uh, really respected her, tough Dutch woman. But I thought, man, in the early 50s, you're going to be called? So I, I was doubting. But she said, I feel God has, has spoken to me. So cut a long story short, um, how God worked miraculously. And uh, you'll see the photos there of Jackie and her little kids. And those children she nurtured for how many years? 15 or so years till they became young women. And we supported her. She was our first missionary. And that kind of got the ball rolling of us being a mission-sending church, of raising up missionaries and them going out. And we have today... Um, Jeremy Steele, who is uh, one of our, our youth pastor, who's a missionary to the nations. Um, we've got Pastor Bill and Norma Osborne, who are key team members here, who've set up an amazing ministry in Uganda, Africa. And their son, Jonathan, who's one of our, fa our, our favorite guest speakers here, preaching the gospel, planting churches, and doing evangelistic campaigns in Uganda. Um, wonderful people. I think of, uh, of people like Norma Betcher, Ray's mum, who most of you don't know her, but gee, she was a blessing to me. I still think of her, and I never heard an unkind word coming out of her mouth. And Norma and Mrs. Thompson, Dorothy Thompson, were my two mother figures who would come with me in the car before we had an office and staff when I would have to visit people, and particularly women on their own, and because uh, it was just, you know, what do you do? So they would come and they would read a book in the kitchen and I would visit and pray and minister to people. And uh, they were mother figures who just contributed, helped me to actually outwork my ministry in those early years. Uh, I think of, um, of uh, the Thompsons, Len and Dorothy Thompson, uh, the dentist, and Dot who used to travel with me. Dot and Len decided in 1979 uh, I'd baptised Len and ran a small group in his home when he became a Christian in the Sturt Street Church, our mother church of the CRC. And when I came down, he rang me and said, Bill, I just feel like I need, I, I want to come to a smaller church and to kind of serve among young people. And he's in his late 50s. He was an old man. <laughs> Those of us in our 60s. And um, what a blessed day it was when Len and Dorothy came and joined the church. And they gave and gave and gave and gave of their time, of their money, of their resources. And, um, and their ashes are out in, in our little garden there. I think of uh, Keith and Dorothy Redman, who have gone to be with the Lord. And just a little thing like Keith and Len, and also uh, Mr. Highland, uh, Robin's dad, uh, the, silver, the silver fox we called him, and Tom Highland. And I think of, of, of Len and, and, and um, Keith he used to be at the door all the time. And Kathy said to me years later that um, those two old boys, every week, as a young woman, she was 24, married to me, uh, would give her a hug and a kiss and a welcome, and it helped bring healing into her soul uh, because of the difficulties that she had with her own uh, natural family, and particularly her dad. And so it wasn't my preaching that healed her, it was two men who would just say hi and give her a love and a kiss. Isn't it amazing what the church can do? Just community, beautiful men. I think of uh, John Van and Ross Auden, who have gone to be with the Lord, and their widows are here with us today. Those two men could prophesy. 
And uh, when they would gear up to give a word from the Lord, you actually listened because you knew they would prayed, they reflected, and John would do it a couple of times a year, and he was so quiet, but when he would, you would always listen because you knew you heard from the Lord. And Ross, of course, uh, our, our flaming redhead, when he would prophesy and how he served and now his wife is still serving, gone to be with Jesus. And um, beautiful people. Um, I'm so grateful and thankful for those saints. And I'm, I'm, I mention only some of them. There are others who, who we have people here whose relatives have gone to be with the Lord. And they are fantastic. We must never forget the communion of all the saints. They're not dead, they're alive, they're in heaven, and we're going to see them again. And so uh, they helped build uh, and, and found the Christi founded the Christian Family Centre. Um, I guess if I want to give you a scripture this morning, um, is would have to be Acts chapter 2, because the very first church in the world was the Jerusalem church. And we know exactly what it looked like, not the physical building, not who were the specific members, we knew Peter, James, John, and those were there, but the essential nature of that church, the overriding characteristics of that church, because Dr. Luke, who was a Greek medical doctor, who joined the team of the Apostle Paul, and uh, something like 27 years after the Jerusalem church was founded, and when the Holy Spirit came down, and our emphasis this month is on the Holy Spirit and, and receiving his fullness. But Luke joined Paul's ministry team nearly 30 years after the Jerusalem church started. And, um, and then Paul ended up in jail in Caesarea, and we think that Luke then, because he had nothing to do, he started doing interviews with the people, including Jesus' mother Mary, to form his Gospel of Luke and also the Book of Acts, the beginnings of it. Because... Because his gospel of Luke, for example, Mark, Matthew and John and, and Mark, who were there when these events happened, they don't record what Mary thought on the inside. Only Luke. It was a kind medical doctor who could put his feet under someone's table and, and she opened up and shared her heart of what she was really feeling. So Luke's gospel is the most magnificent piece of writing. And the book of Acts, he, he interviewed those people and I reckon he asked the question, guys, don't give me the details. Just what was the spirit like? What was the feel? What was the vibe? What was the attitude? What was the vision? What was the heart? And so when you read Acts 2 verses 41 to 47, it, it's, it's a simple statement, but it's loaded with timeless, transferable truths that have guided every church ever since, including the Christian Family Centre. It is the greatest statement of what a church should look like. And, uh, and I love it. And I've endeavoured to align my thinking and my own believing uh, to the paradigm of that church. So if you read Acts 2 and Acts 4, it's beautiful. So let's read it in the message, because I think you'll, you'll enjoy this. Uh, I love Eugene Peterson. He says, that day, about 3,000 took him, Peter, at his word as Peter preached. The Holy Spirit came, they got baptised, started speaking in brand new languages they'd never learnt. Peter preaches the gospel, and 3,000 believed and accepted. And then they were baptised in water and were signed up. I love what Eugene says. It's like water baptism is the signing up. It's like personal belief is, is between you and God, and who knows when that happens. But water baptism is a public act where you're saying, Jesus is my boss, my master. I'm connecting to a Christian community. I'm going to be a witness I want to serve in the church. I want to be a witness in the world. I'm flying the flag high. I belong to Jesus. I want to be one of his disciples. That's why water baptism is so important. And baptism in the Holy Spirit, where we receive the power of God to be able to witness and speak in a new prayer language. And that dynamic transforms us uh, on the inside. Well, this is what happened to these guys. And then it says, they committed or wholeheartedly devoted, the NIV says, themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Ministry of the Word, preaching, teaching, the life together, fellowship, doing life together. The Greek word kinonia is a beautiful word. It's more than fellowship. It's sharing, participating. And I think Peterson has said it well, doing life together. You cannot be a New Testament Christian. It can't be an Acts 2 church if you say, well, I've just got a relationship with Jesus, but forget about my relationship with other people. The vertical must show itself horizontally. And so these people loved each other. And, uh, and the Christian Family Centre has 
over the last 40 years has been a, a, my, my journey of 38 years leading this church. The love of Christ flowing through God's people, touching needy, lost humanity is palpable. You can feel it. You can sense it. Um, and so these people, it says they wholeheartedly devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal. So they would have meals together. And then the Lord's Supper, communion, that always occurred in people's homes. When they ate, then they said, let's have a bit of wine and a bit of bread. Let's just thank Jesus for, for this day. It was very communal in that sense. And it says, and, and the prayers, notice that? And you get the feeling like this wasn't a flicker of fire. This was, they were a flame. They were wholeheartedly devoted to teaching, to worship, to prayer, to fellowship. This is the normal Christian life. And, uh, and it says everyone around was in awe, people outside. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. We could write a book of several hundred pages of the stories of God's miracle working power, his provisions, his guidance that is right from the early days. And Ray in Murray Bridge, there was a season where there was a whole pile of unique physical healings, people dying of cancer, people with amazing terminal incurable illness that were, all, that were healed. It sort of was an amazing healing. And we actually recorded, Ray recorded those down. That happens in certain seasons. That's not the season now, but it was the season then. It'll come back again. And I think of other amazing acts of guidance by God. Every one of our church plants, every one of them, there is a supernatural dimension of the Holy Spirit speaking and directing. Where you think, man, God is at work. Sure, he uses us, but we are the vehicles. We're, we're the pots of jar. We're, we're, we're the jar pots of clay. We're the jars. The excellency of the power is God working through people who just make themselves available and yield themselves to him so he can work amazingly through them. This is the first church. Everyone around was in awe, all those wonders and signs done through the apostles. Do you know out there in the community, sometimes it blows me away, where, where I'm the longest serving pastor of a church in Adelaide at the moment. There's no one that's actually been leading a church for more than 38 years. And you know there's a thousand eagle eyes watching and looking? And you know when the press did that terrible thing about me, you know that terrible story a couple of years ago? You've got to believe the letters and people that they said, oh Bill, we know you, we know your reputation, we know the Christian Family Centre, we know it's a lot of bull what she's written. <laughs> I might use the other part, but you know what I mean. <laughs> And the heads of Christian churches that I was chairing, the, the archbishops, bishops, they all just said, oh, Bill, we, we know you. We know the Christian Family Centre. We know the CRC. And so that's just interesting that there is an excellent reputation that we have. It's not that we're looking for it. You're just trying, we're just trying to be Christians aligned to the New Testament pattern. But out there, people are looking and watching and observing. And, uh, and, and I am, am so thankful of the unity and love and integrity that has permeated right from the very first days of, of this church. It says, all the believers lived in wonderful harmony. We have never had a division in the life of the Christian Family Center. We have never had a major bust up in any way. And yet the leaders are strong people and uh, no one's a yes person, no one on the board has been like that over the years. We've had, I think, 25 or 27 different board members that have been on, and I'll introduce the initial group. But there's you know, strong men, strong women, capable, intelligent, and we can agree to disagree agreeably. There's never been blood on the floor. There's never been nastiness or behaviour that's unbecoming of the church. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that and pray that will happen for the next generation as well. And it says they, they sold whatever they owned and pulled their resources so that each person's need was met. The context there is... The 3,000 people that got saved, a lot of them couldn't go back home. They were Hellenistic-speaking Jews. And they'd come to worship in Jerusalem. So they got saved and persecution set in. And so therefore, the Hebraic Jews of Judea had to support them. So what they did, they actually sold properties and pulled their funds. We don't do that. That's not, that's not a practice that we do today. But the timeless transferable truth is generosity, sharing, supporting people in need. And that's been the story of the Christian Family Centre. 
and the, the great generosity of people in, the, in their liberality uh, of giving millions of dollars that have been given towards facilities and missions and church planting and, and all of that that has taken place has been thrilling. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, big place like this, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praise God. Big meetings, small meetings. That's the pattern, and we try and follow that pattern. People in general like what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added to those who were being saved. Isn't that a fantastic picture? Oh, I could spend hours opening that up. There are about 10 timeless transferable principles, truths that that I use as a continuum. For me, I have it written out, so now, where is the Christian Family Centre? Are we above five? Oh, we're slipping down a little bit here in prayer. We're slipping back a little bit in evangelism, and it helps to guide me to say, God, by your power and grace, help us to be aligned to be the Acts 2 church. And, and how do we do that? It's by being committed to Christ's great commandment and, and his great commission. The two great statements of Jesus, there's probably no greater statement by the Lord Jesus. The great commandment when he says, well, what's, what's it all about, the Old Testament? From Genesis to Malachi, it's all about the worship of God with authenticity, with heart, and, and serving the best interests of people, worship, ministry. He summarizes the whole Old Testament when, when they try to trick him in Matthew 22. Then the Great Commission in Matthew, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, where he says the whole purpose, Jesus says, the first, my final words are to be the first priority of Christians. That is evangelism, winning lost men and women to Christ, presenting the gospel of who Jesus is, the Son of God, who died on a cross, who rose again, who went to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, who can change people on the inside to become new creations. And then fellowship, incorporating them into communities, churches, and then discipling them to become ministers in the church and missionaries in the world. So the purpose of the church, the great commandment, the great commission about worship, ministry, evangelism, which leads to church planting and world missions and fellowship, incorporating people to grow in Christ and to become disciples fully committed to outwork his purposes. That's, that's how you become an Acts 2 church. And we've just endeavoured And if you read our vision and mission statement, it's built around those three verses, Acts 2, Matthew 22, Matthew 28. Simply, we just want to be a biblically functioning Christian community. So a lot of churches, a lot of pastors would say to me, Bill, what's your vision for this year? What's God saying to you this year? I'm saying, well, my vision's the same as last year, and God's telling me the same things he's been telling me for the last 40 years. The Great Commission's been given. The Great Commandment has been told us. It's now a matter of saying, God, help us through a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, to be able to better do it. I'm not satisfied with what we have. We have around 2,500 people as part of the Christian Family Centre churches. We have seven churches and five outreaches. I'm thinking, in the next 10 years, God, I'm thankful, don't get me wrong, I'm thankful for what's taken place. But I'm thinking ahead, say, you know, I reckon we should have 5,000 people by our 50th birthday. And I reckon we should have something like like uh, double the number of churches and outreaches. So I'm still scheming and and thinking and praying and strategizing of how we can continue to impact our world because our world is lost and it needs Jesus. And I I know that Ray and Bill and David, as pastors who are older than me, the first team, they would say the same thing. We're not living in the past, but we're thankful for what's taken place. But we're just so thrilled with the new generation of leaders now arising. Look at them, our team here, Cass and and Tim and, and Nathan and all of them in their 30s and functioning and flowing powerfully. Same as Murray Bridge and, and, and Alice Springs and, and of course now David Bland up at, he's not in his 30s, he's still in his 40s though. And so we're just thrilled with what God, God has done and will do. I've asked the three musketeers, pastors Ray Betcher, David Smythe and Bill Osborne to share a little bit about the Tin Cathedral days, 1976, with Ray, and then the Scout Hall days, 77 through to to West Beach School, Davy Smythe, and then Bill from 1982 to 86 till we came here, the Grange days, and Bill was our first full-time staff member. When he came on, he was children's pastor, administrator, office manager, and building supervisor, and he had a couple of nervous breakdowns on the way doing it. But uh, amazing, And, and their wives, Rob and Narina, and, and uh, oh, sorry, Norma, I missed you, and, and my wife, Kathy. We could not do, this is the first board, official board, when we got contact. We could not have done what we've done without their support. How they put up with us is a miracle. 
It does work. Marriages can stay together because these four guys were very difficult men to live with. Isn't that right, girls? They still are. <laughs> Don't say that. So I'm going to ask Ray and David and Bill to come and share their hearts a little bit on, on uh, the three of you. Come up here, guys, and, and share with us. Let's welcome them. Hey, this is the first board. For those who don't know, Ray started the church in his home, Mother's Day 1976. And most of you are aware of the story. Within a period of time, he didn't want to lead it. He wanted me to lead it. But I felt no, even though God called me to go to the western suburbs, I thought I was going to start another church. But circumstances changed. And I came here two years or so after it started. And David and Bill were already part of the team. So I'm 24. David was... <laughs> Can I say it, David? He was... He loves to tell people this. He was 11 years older than me. You figure it out. He doesn't look a day over 50, does he? And, um, and I, I looked to those guys. They were mature men in their marriage, in their families, and they ministered to me as a young Greek, very ethnic guy, endeavouring to lead, strong in leadership gift, but very needy in some other areas. And their example, just in, in their personal walk with God and with people, did the world of good for me. Without them, I don't know I could be the person, I wouldn't be the person I am today. So I really honour you, Ray, David and Bill, and so share your hearts now, hey? Family Centre 40 years ago, 10 a.m. You would pull your car up and park it in Banks Avenue, Flinders Park. You would get out of your car. You'd enter through the front uh, doorway of an old tin shed, double garage. You would walk over strips of flat metal. Um, you would bend down so you didn't hit your head on the canoes uh, in the ceiling. And then you'd go through the garden, just a metre or a couple of metres, two or three metres, and you would enter into a 20 by 40 shed. In that shed, big sliding door, you'd walk through the big sliding door, and in that shed was a variety of chairs. On the front right-hand side, there were three old lounge chairs occupied by three middle-aged ladies, Norma Betcher, Shirley Betcher, and Mrs. Stanfield, and then the, the chairs were a variety of bench chairs, kitchen chairs, uh, beach chairs, you name it. Um, and if it was a big morning, you didn't get a chair, you stood in the doorway of the, of the sliding door, or you stood looking in through the louver windows. At uh, 10 o'clock, the worship would start, and uh, the worship was led by Steve West, and uh, a couple of other acoustic guitarists. Uh, so we had Steve West on acoustic guitar, uh, Diane Squirrel Betcher, uh, Carolyn um, Stan, uh, Stimson Betcher, um, Marilyn West, and uh, they would lead us in worship. And as these young people, it was uh, occupied by teenagers and young adults, around the 40 mark, I guess, and and uh, they would start leading us in worship and the presence of God would fall and the tears would flow and uh, the miracles would occur and uh, young teenagers and young adults would receive Christ and it was just an amazing presence in that place, in that tin shed. You know, today uh, we walk through fantastic foyers and sit in fantastic seating and we have uh, fantastic uh, musical items and you know all this musical equipment and sound systems and we begin to worship the Lord and the tears flow and people receive Christ and get saved um, but you know what the difference is always the presence of God the presence of Jesus by his Holy Spirit and so whether you have, you know, fantastic sound systems and, uh, you know, 20 singers or whether you have, you know, three singers and acoustic guitars, the life actually comes from the presence of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thank you. David, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, so it's 40 years ago, our time flies. We uh, were meeting in the Kidman Park Scout Hall. Um, it was pretty much a young people's church, apart from Norma and Shirley Betcher. Uh, about 40 or 50 of us would gather for the morning service and then sometimes up to about 70 for the evening service. Um, we were in a pretty average sort of building. It did keep the rain off. That, uh, was some, one thing it had going for us. You know, when the crows run out in front of 50,000 people, they go through those flame throwers and then the mini league kind of form a guard of honour. Our guard of honour as we entered church were beer bottles. The scouts would collect them. But the church uh, began to grow. Mark Betcher was the first baby born into the church, so there was growth. And then my son Joshua was born, second baby born into the life of the church, the family had begun. All we had going for us, and maybe this is all we needed, God was for us, and there were a group of young people that were excited about knowing God and serving him. So we relocated to the West Beach Primary School with Janet Bryce's help, I remember. We met in a common room attached to the main building, and I want to let you know, I installed the air conditioning system at that meeting area. On hot days, on hot days, I would put my garden sprinkler on the roof, connect it to the nearest tap and let it rip. I never stopped to think how much of the school's water I used. Um, our pre-service prayer meeting was held in the school sick room. Had a big sign on it, sick room. And I'll never forget when we had a visiting speaker. He was a triumphalist. He was the sort of guy that you could only think and say positive words. And we invited him into the prayer room and he read sick room. He couldn't get over. We'll be praying in the sick room. A lesson. I was preaching or teaching. My boy Joss was three or four. And I'm out the front, very important person preaching. And I see my son had escaped from children's church. <laughs> he was about to come down the aisle. And I said, would someone please take my boy back to children's church? I regret that to this day. <laughs> if I had my time again, I would say, Josh, you're looking for your dad? Come here to me. I would have picked him up. I would have hugged him. And I would have said to everyone, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. I would have talked to him. I would have hugged him. And I would have said, Josh, maybe you need to head back. See you at half time and we'll have a biscuit together. I learned a lesson. People are more important than program. Final little point. We would have our morning tea break or interval halfway through the service. And one day... There was a visitor there, and she said to me, oh, I like this church. I love a small church. And I said, we have a vision to grow. What are you going to do then? <laughs> she never came back. <laughs> we did start growing, and I'll tell you why. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm a know-it-all, but I know the key to revival. I know the key to church growth. It's found in these simple words written in Mark 3.20. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered. Not about Basilakis or Betcha or Osborne or Smythe. It's about Jesus. <clears throat> I always wished I'd go before David. He's a hard act to follow. <laughs> he hasn't changed. <laughs> anyway, 82 or 3 to 86. Man, what a phase in our life, Norma. 1983, we were in the Grange School, and I really want to honour Alan Lawson. I think as the principal without him... Pacifying teachers as to why their room was all back the front every Monday morning after we invaded seven classrooms and did kids' church. 
And uh, I think Alan kept the piece really well there. It was a great facility to have. But as David said, we were committed to growth. And so that led to us sketching up this building. I remember the first sketch of a floor plan I did for Bill. It was two squares joined together. I said, Bill, that's your auditorium and this is my kids' hall. <laughs> and uh, let's do it. But it was a seven-year journey from that sketch to November 86 to see this place open. During those years, we met at Grange. And, uh, you know, I think in those days, we were just so committed. We made huge sacrifice. I know Norma and I did. I know these other guys did and their wives to see happen what, what happened here. I remember the day my father died. It was a Saturday night. And uh, Sunday, I had 100 kids coming to the Green School, expecting Uncle Bill, demanding that I just be there, really. And uh, so I turned up. We did it. The day my mother died. That night, we had 45 kids arriving at our little house at Henley Beach. I don't mean the little house. I mean the house. And, um, you know, we opened up as normal. Um, when we lost our first baby, I left Norm at the hospital, came back, and we did our Joy Time Bible Club. And kids got saved. Hundreds of kids got saved in our house there. And I thought, man, we better, better get a church soon, otherwise we'll have to build one in our backyard. Our church building, I mean. So they were exciting days. They were wonderful days. And putting this place up, um, I don't know, I think God just gave us super strength, super blessing on our marriages. I remember 11 getting here at 6 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock at night after painting the ceiling all day, two five-gallon drums of paint down the scaffolding and go home. <laughs> Pretty exhausted but I was strong in those days and I had hair and I could hear properly and everything. <laughs> so while you're young, go for it. Young leaders, go for it. 1983 in my spare time, I had a day off, it was Thursday, that was my sanity break. So Norm and I, we built broken gum out of nothing. We had no money. And I remember the camp started there and the numbers grew and the shed got too small. The shed we actually live in right now, <laughs> the eating shed, um, got too small. I said, God, I need $1,100 to extend the shed. And uh, dear old Ross Orden came up and said, Bill, I really feel God saying I, I should give you $1,100. So I said, thanks. <laughs> And he was so blessed because he used to come to all the camps and serve God there with Heather and uh, it really blessed him to see how that little room was used and now it's our bedroom. <laughs> they were challenging days. I remember um, not long after 86, um, I, I had the checkbook. You had to keep it from this guy. <laughs> Otherwise the church would have been broke in two weeks. But <laughs> it was a great honour to hold that checkbook and keep this church in the black. But we did have to take a $700,000 mortgage to get the place up. And we did that because of, we got it up because of wonderfully committed people here. Little people who gave little amounts that added up. Um, by little, I don't, they, they weren't millionaires, they're just ordinary people, pensioners who just gave sacrificially to see this place up. They served. I remember this beautiful, gracious Indian lady, Mary Varghese, covered in paint, painting the kitchen out there in that khaki yellow that we did this place. Is it still the same colour? I don't know. Um, those were the days. They were pioneering days. And why did it succeed? Why did it grow? This is what I put down. I believe it's because, like my conversion at 21 years of age, it's because of the world-class Bible teaching that we all received under Leah Harris and in the CRC Bible School that we all attended and went to. And Pastor Bill has carried on the spirit of that teaching, the doctrine, being a new creation, knowing that you can kick the devil in the teeth, that you have authority over him, uh, knowing the, the second coming of Christ, knowing there is a heaven, knowing there is a hell. They were amazing days, um, amazing teaching that we carried. And, and the kids, we just simplified it and taught all the kids in this church. What a blessing today to watch Tanya lead worship. I remember she was this high and we're trying to do a rehearsal for a musical and she's doing cartwheels across the stage and <laughs> which way did she go? I remember Alyssa coming her first Sunday to Sunshine is up there. She was about that high, a little patch over her eye. I just wanted to scoop her up and love her really and, and we did that over the years. 
and Melissa was there, Nathan. To see these kids today, that was normal. What a blessing. It's great, isn't it? So the spirit of it all goes on. Um, when you had to serve side by side, we understood sacrificial leadership. We had a pioneering spirit and uh, a supportive faith-filled congregation and unswerving leadership from this guy here. You know, Bill gives out a lot of honour. He can make a criminal feel free, you know? <laughs> but he's not very good at taking it. But I want to honour him today because um, he's built into this church a culture of honour and he loves doing that. And I think it's good fuel for any leader in his team. And so it's great to see that continuing here. Yeah, let's honour him. Finally, we also believe that people needed to be saved. That's why we walk the streets. Alan Steele and Jill came in because some New Guinea guys went there. And uh, we'd sent buses out. We had outreach clubs. I remember in those years, we had an outreach club in North Haven Primary School, Taparu Primary School, Semaphore South Primary School, Fulham North Primary School, and our house. And I kept my sanity and happily married. <laughs> so that's the kind of commitment that grows a church. And, you know, we were pioneers in those days. We had a pioneering spirit. I learned 10, 15 years ago that I'm a pioneer. That's why I'm not, you know, don't fit the normal mould sometimes. But I would challenge this church. You were birthed in a pioneering spirit. Don't ever arrive. A pioneer never arrives. You sit here, you look at that wall and you think, that's a temporary wall. It's meant to come out and the hall's meant to double. That balcony is meant to be filled. It's great planning churches, but home base, keep everything going and growing. That's what pioneers do. And you, you count the cost. You, you do whatever it takes. So God bless you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Yeah, great. Yeah, Whoa, yeah, wonderful. Well, that was uh, uh, very encouraging. Thank you, guys, for, for sharing. The as I bring this to a conclusion, the Christian Family Centre has been, is. And I pray will always be a Bible-based, cross-focused, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-dependent, people-loving, and outwardly-oriented, missional, that's continually developing and releasing new ministry leaders, church planters, and uh, missionaries. And about 10 years ago, I put together, with the help of some pastors, um, a statement, some of our team here, that I've called, I have a dream. I'd like to read this to you uh, now, because it still expresses my heart about the Christian Family Centre, and, and I'm thankful to God, really am, that we've seen a measure of this dream fulfilled over the past 40 years, and I'm convinced that this dream will gradually be realised in even more fruitful ways in the coming decades. I have a dream for the Christian Family Centre, that we will be a Bible-based, Christ-centred and contemporary Australian church, grace-filled local church communities where people of all races and ages fully devote themselves to following Jesus Christ. It's a dream we all share, a dream of being a truly authentic New Testament church, of people who fervently love Jesus, who genuinely love each other and who passionately love the unreached of our world are people who influence our world for good by living Christ-like lives wherever we are and whatever we do. Imagine our church with thousands of on-fire disciples who energetically embrace Jesus' great commandment, worshipping God with full abandon and selflessly ministering to humanity's deepest needs. Imagine this united army wholeheartedly committed to obeying the Great Commission constantly reaching out to spiritually lost people with the miracle working gospel of Jesus Christ. Local bodies of believers who know deep down that the church has been entrusted with Christ's life changing message, Jesus Church really is the only hope for our world. I see many hundreds of men and women, young and old, being taught 
trained and mentored to fulfill Jesus' leadership call on their lives. What an awesome vision. Hundreds of leaders being powerfully equipped and led by the Holy Spirit to go throughout Australia and the nations, changing worlds. I see CFC ministers and missionaries and church planters birthing new churches, establishing new people-helping ministries and developing new humanitarian ventures. Ordinary people, empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish extraordinary things in Christ's name. I see hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people in heaven, welcoming, welcoming us into the very presence of the Father. Can you hear them cheering wildly at our homecoming? All because we allow Jesus to soften our hearts and expand our vision to match his very own. This is not just my dream. This is God's heart for the Christian Family Centre. And it really is possible. As we prayerfully unite and purposefully work together, uplifting Christ's name and doing Christ's will here on earth, Jesus promises us, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Oh Lord, build your church and let this dream become a reality. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together. Let's stand.